welcome to another episode of Success Leaves Clues. I'm extremely fortunate today to have a government official in the house, a former pastor of Lighter World Church, current deputy mayor of Indianapolis. I'm joined by Dr. David Hampton. Thanks for coming on, man. Brother Gary, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, no question. So we're going to get into the city and the state of the dress and everything that's going on downtown. But first, I, I want people to kind of learn a little bit more about you. Like, where are you from? Like, uh, where did you grow up? Where, are you from Indianapolis? I am from Indi Indianapolis, born and raised. Uh, grew up on the east side, uh, Butler. Okay. Uh, some people uh, know that Pastor Jeffrey Johnson grew up on Butler Street. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, a lot of us came from the east side and uh, grew up um, single parent home. Mm -hmm. uh, as I tell people all the time, I was a product of busing. So, wow. you know, I lived across the street. I could have walked to Arlington High School, but I ended up going to Lawrence North High School. Wow. On the north side. So, um, you know, I know all of the struggles and all of the challenges of, of growing up here in Indianapolis. So it's, uh, it's great to be able to come back full circle and give back, you know, to my community. I'm just a homeboy from around the way. Man, that's awesome. And that's really a uh, true <clears throat> inspiration because I think one of the things, as I see it, um, some of the young people that I, I look at, I mentor, I speak with, it's like they suffer from hopelessness. Right. And, you know, people that live in probably the same neighborhood that you lived in, right. they think there's no way out. Right. And I think seeing people like you kind of shows them that there is a way out if you stay consistent. Absolutely. And if you uh, to do the work. Um, so growing up, did you play any sports growing up? I did. I, football and track. Okay. Football and track. Uh, love football. Huge football fan. I was a quarterback and... Uh, and I ran track, was a hurdler, so uh, you know I'm way out of shape at this point. <laughs> so you can't get over that hurdle right now. Is it? Not right now. That leg ain't getting no, up. No, uh, that's funny. So, um, so walk me through. Where, did you go to college? I know you had a stint in New York City. So what, what happened when you left Lawrence North? Uh, where, where so you go I uh, got football and track scholarship to UND. Okay. The University of Indianapolis. When I was there, it's, it's not. It wasn't as nearly as nice as it is right, now. Yeah, it's but, nice uh, so UND uh, attended there. After that, uh, went on to seminary, uh, earned a master's degree, a doctoral degree in ministry uh, from Christian Theological Seminary, and, and here I am today. That's awesome. So were, were you always led? Was someone in your family like a, a pastor, preacher, like inside the church? Like what led you to become um, a pastor? Yeah, I always tell people uh, I didn't choose it. It chose me, you know, mm -hmm. any calling, it, it calls us and chooses us. But, you know, I, I was I was very blessed to have been raised in the church. Mm -hmm. my, my family was involved in church. My grandmother was a music minister. She established a lot of the uh, choirs around the city of Indianapolis, you know, God rest her soul. So I was always exposed to the culture of church. So nobody was surprised when I announced my calling. I grew up at Eastern Star Church, so that, wow. that's my home church. Made my announcement there was licensed there, ordained there uh, under Pastor Jeffrey Johnson. So um, <clears throat> my experience was one in which for me, I feel like I was blessed uh, to be raised in that environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but everybody's not. Um, but uh, it's a calling that uh, you feel that you can't, you can't shake. You right. can't shake. I couldn't run from it. So. so it's amazing though at that young age you, had, you made that decision because I'm sure you probably have friends that were you know, not in the church, right? And, and maybe judged you, right? So how as a young person do you deal with that, right? You you committed yeah. to serve the Lord, to, to yeah. walk a straight and narrow path, and other people just, you know, they're not there yet. Yeah, you know, and, and I'm hoping what I'm getting ready to say blesses a lot of young people, but you know, when I was in college, that's when I accepted my calling. So mm. and that was be before I was 21, you know, I was looking forward to turning 21 so I can go to the bars. Yeah, and, yeah and do all of that and drink. And I'm not saying I didn't do all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the way God, you know, uh, transitioned my life, that's not the life I ended up being in, you know, and I struggle with that. How do you on a college campus accept a calling to be a preacher yeah. but still live out your the college life that most normal college kids yeah, live? Yeah. And I struggle with that. And I went through, I feel, an identity crisis of how do I be, who should I be? And I just decided I need to just be myself, mm. just be who you are. So yeah, I went to parties, I did all of that, but every Sunday I was in church. I didn't care if I was there with a hangover, right. <laughs> but I was there and I'm just keeping it real, you know. Um, and I think a lot of us have to realize that whatever God calls us to, you don't have to become something you're not. Mm. God will still use you 
in the midst of the imperfections. And matter of fact, I don't know if anybody God did use who was perfect. You look right. through, through the Bible, uh, no who question. God used, everybody God uses had some imperfection except Jesus. So we have to allow God to use us in the ways that he wants. Because my plan was to go to law school. Wow. I mean, I, my, my undergrad degree is in criminal justice. I wanted to be an attorney. That's all I wanted to do. But I knew God gave me a gift to speak. I just didn't know he was shaping it to to speak in his in his pulpit. So one thing led to another, and that's what happened. Man, that's awesome. So uh, 20 years as a pastor. Yeah. So what, what are some of the things, what are the good, the bad that you learned um, yeah. in, inside of the church and, and, and being a pastor? I think, and I'm not bragging, but you know, I think God has given me a unique opportunity that uh, if I'm not the only, there are many who have had my experiences. Mm -hmm. I, I followed not one, but two legendary pastors. Yeah. I mean, for those who, who know preachers and preaching and pastoring. Uh, Dr. William Augustus Jones in Brooklyn, New York. I mm -hmm. mean, he, he led Operation Breadbasket for New York during the civil rights struggle for Martin Luther King. Uh, Reverend Al Sharpton was a member of my church, still is a member of that church there. Wow. Um, a lot of rich history there. And then I come back to Indianapolis and follow uh, T. Garrett Benjamin Jr., mm -hmm. uh, you know, of Latter World Christian Church. Not too many young preachers and pastors can say they've had the experience of following two major figures. Uh, so, you know, that's a part of my journey I'd like to write about someday. But the downside is how do you establish your own identity mm. following, you know, two 40 plus year pastors? Then you have to come in, young man, and establish a new vision for people who have been used to a, a vision under a great leader. Uh, for so many years and so I think I have experiences around how to lead through change uh, you know establishing your own identity learning how to respect the traditions that exist but then right. be brave enough to move people to in, into new territory so and those things transfer right you know it yeah. those transfer into business uh, into any aspect of the world so God has allowed me to travel the world I've preached on just about every continent Wow. Um, you know I, the Bible says God will make your gift make room for you and put you before kings and queens. I've met dignitaries. Mm. I've met Barack Obama. Just shaking Barack Obama's hand, you yeah. know, for me is a, a highlight. So no, no question. I just thank God for the experiences, and uh, I hope I can take those with me. No, that's awesome. So one thing I think um, dealing with today, the current pandemic, dealing with the struggles, you know, people are dealing with at home, uh, school, um, teachers, uh, in the church, like when, when you're talking about identity, right. what what are some some lessons that you could kind of share that kind of help someone like you know understand the identity? Because I feel like I, I struggle with this where your identity was that you were a football player or your mm -hmm. identity that we were a business owner. Yeah. But when you realize no, that's that's what you do. That's not who you are. Right. And I think that really you know helps you. But like in terms of in the church and like trying your find your identity, being proud about who that is. Right. Like what what things did you uncover? Wow, man, you know, I tell you, th this is almost like a, a therapy session because right. these are things that in, in doing counseling and also receiving counseling mm -hmm. and therapy myself because that's important. I'll never forget what uh, a therapist told me one time. He said, David, you're going to have to figure out how to be a human being and not a human doing. Mm -hmm. He said, you, your identity is wrapped up in what you do, mm -hmm. but who are you? You know, you have to be happy with you at the end of the day. So... Uh, I think when it comes to our identities, we can't be defined just by what we do. We have to love what we do. We have to be who we are. So for me, I use whatever I do as my pulpit to really share the gospel. That's my Christian identity. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where I am, if I'm in the state house or in the city county building or uh, in media, I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ no matter what. So I'm going to use that as my opportunity to express my faith. But there's more to me than just that too. And like we talk, talked about earlier, we as black people should not limit ourselves to be monolithic. Mm -hmm. we, we can do more than one thing. Um, you can be a football player, turn businessman, right. entrepreneur, a restaurant owner, author, and now, uh, you know, now a consultant to teach other people how to be successful. And I think we all should maximize our potential. And I'm not sure we even reach our potential because we mm -hmm. listen to the naysayers who allow who who wants to be boxed in, but we can only be boxed in if we allow that. Right. 
it's, it's amazing. I think Steve Harvey did a great job about explaining, like, um, I think it was like the mosquitoes or a gnat in a jar. And there was a jar, and, um, you know, so when they were in the jar, the mosquitoes, before they had, like, the highest vertical jump. But they went out of the jar, if they jump the vert, they're gonna hit their head. Right. So now, like subconsciously, they say, you know what? I'm not gonna use my highest jump. I'm gonna like jump right underneath this yep. lid. Yep. Right, so then what happens? Then they have kids. And what they tell their kids? They're gonna tell their kids, you got this 36 inch vert. Right. Now you're gonna tell them, hey, don't jump too high, you wanna hit your head. Right. So now you're putting your fear and your limitations on them. And right. for years and years and years, I feel like that's what happened inside of our communities. I agree. And now I know people are telling you like, hey, live, live your dream. It's, it's better to, to, to try and fail than have not tried at all. Exactly. And, and I think so many people are so hung up on the failing, especially now public on social media, right. the backlash that they get that they'd they're, they're, they're rather not try. Right. It's best to just, you know, we walk by faith. Mm. Not by sight. Uh, I think fear holds us back. Fear of what other people think. Fear of what people are going to say. Fear of failure. Throw that fear out the door, and you don't know the potential of how mm. successful you can be if you're willing to to be who you are and be brave in that. You know. Right. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of growing in that too, even while we're speaking. But I'm finding that life is much more rewarding when you're able to not live it in fear. Nah, that's amazing. Uh, and that really uh, brings us to like. Uh, your current career, deputy mayor, uh, big job inside the city of Indianapolis. Yeah. Obviously, uh, you know, I think the state of address happened, I believe, a week ago. Um, you have things that you're involved in um, that you've been giving out uh, forums <coughs> and uh, conversations inside the community. Right. Um, 2020 has been a challenging year. Right. Um, obviously, COVID, George Floyd, um, some of the other crimes, the protests, the riots. Um, so let's, let's kind of bite size this, like, um, Let's talk about uh, COVID um, first, right? Um, Deputy Mayor, what are some of the effects that you're seeing um, because of COVID and, and what is the, the city of Indianapolis um, doing as, as a result of that? Yeah, so, you know, COVID uh, is something that has revealed a lot of health disparities in the black community. Mm -hmm. That's what we're drilled down on in the city of Indianapolis. Uh, it revealed that black people uh, were three times more likely to die from COVID mm. uh, because we have so many, uh, Dr. Kane would say comorbidity rates are higher, but we have so many preconditions, uh, high blood pressure, uh, you know, heart disease. Right. Everything that affects black people always hits us harder, right? So you overlay COVID, a global pandemic, and again, we're hit the hardest. So we're not only hit physically, but we're hit socioeconomically. Right. We talking about the unemployment rates for the country, but who's gonna have the highest unemployment rate? Right. Black people. Yeah. Um, we're talking about even frontline workers who are at risk, but who are most of the frontline workers? Black people. Right. So COVID is revealing some things, uh, both racially and also physically, that they were probably there, but they're more prevalent now. So. As, city, as a city government, we're trying to figure out ways to sort of offset some of those inequities. And uh, we're doing it through the budget, as the mayor mentioned. And we're, right now we're working on a racial, a race and equity uh, budget throughout the city uh, council, uh, throughout the city budget, meaning every department needs to rethink and think about mm -hmm. how diversity, equity, and inclusion plays into your budget. Because another thing we have to realize, there is no true social justice without economic justice. Right. Anything that's important has money put behind it. We all know that. Right. So if we're going to talk about true racial equity, there has to be dollar signs attached to that. Yeah. And so we're struggling to find those dollars and to figure out how to do that. But even as we talk about, and there's this national conversation of defunding police, what does that mean? Uh, part of that conversation, and we're going to have that conversation tonight, as a matter of fact, but part of that conversation means perhaps re reallocating some of city resources toward mental health issues or youth programs or grassroots programs that help on a daily basis in ways that, that uh, the police cannot. Right. And it's not their job. So why, why do you think that's been such a challenge like for uh, city officials to really like gather, right? Because I think the budgets are constantly increasing for police protection, for police budgets. 
why, why do you think that they're not enough data supporting, like, uh, like reallocating the resources? Because initially, I'm not, I'm gonna admit, when I heard defund the police, I was like, ooh, that sounds like, ooh, defund, like, no police? I didn't know what it meant. But then, after you start researching, no, they've been trying to reform for, like, 20 years, right? And it just hasn't happened. Right. So now the defund is exactly what it means. It's defund, but really it, it's reallocate resources right. because police aren't ne necessarily trained That's right. to deal with some of the issues we talked about earlier about poverty, uh, mental health, some of these issues that they right. come on the scene for and it gets escalated. Right. Well, maybe they weren't the right person to handle that job to begin with. That's right. You know, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think reforms have come in many forms. Mm -hmm. This is nothing new. This uh, idea and notion has been around for 20 plus years. I think now we're wrapping our minds around, okay, how to practically make that happen. What does it look like? What does it mean? And again, uh, I don't know which, if it's the George Floyd or COVID or both, but somehow in our nation, the we are more conscientious about how racial inequities affect us as a society. And I don't think we can turn away from it at this point. You know, George Floyd was probably the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and now is the time to have these conversations because policing does need to be reformed. But let me make one thing clear. People who protest, I've never seen a protest against good policing. Right, right, right. right? You know, protests are always against police brutality and excessive force. And here's the issue, and, and I've shared this in other settings so people can understand. What black people are saying is, I don't think no no nobody is saying we don't want police to do their job because we want them when we need them, right? right? But certain crimes that are committed, like let's say for example the Drajan Reed case, mm -hmm. uh, young black man running, uh, allegedly turns and shoots at a police officer, he's shot multiple times. Uh, but the same incident happened with two young white men who ran from police, high speed chase. They also shot at police, but they were apprehended alive. Right. So there seems to be this inequity and disproportionality with the way black people are treated in America, mm -hmm. far too often by police, and it seems like black has been weaponized. Mm -hmm. You know, we have colorized what we think is criminal, and black people are approached far too often. At least that's what it seems, right? Yeah. So, so people are saying we're fed up with that. Reforms need to happen, but how do we make them happen? Now, I think uh, it, it's it's so interesting um, having these conversations now with people. And, you know, a lot of people are like, man, just things need to get back to where they they're, where they used to be. <laughs> and I'm like, bro, that's that's not going to happen. Like, we, right. we didn't open Pandora's box. Like, this is, like, here. So either now we deal with it and, and we get better and we accept some things about ourselves. Right. Um, or we don't, and we just continue to have, you know, incidents that, that occur with George Floyd and, and the, the protests and everything else that happened as a byproduct of that. That's right. Yeah, I, I think this is the new normal. I mean, yeah. Things aren't going to go back. They can't go back. Yeah. You know, we've already crossed that threshold now. So, so interesting, I, I read something, I saw something on the news. It was one particular uh, protest, because there were several protests downtown Indianapolis, and we're going to touch on that a little bit, and uh, the public safety issue that that presents. Um, but there was one particular incident where um, it was at the governor's mansion. Mm -hmm. Governor's mansion, uh, there's a protest. Mm -hmm. um, the protesters, had, they had some things that they wanted to say to the governor on his footsteps, right? However, the police were there um, as a barricade to, to stop or prevent that from happening, right? right? Um, obviously, we know what occurs where, you know, there's protesters with uh, their demands and their, there's police with their, also their demands in terms of what they want to have. So... I, in a lot of those cases, it's 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 not it's not good. Um, there's there's you know big fights, there's incident, there's killings even um, that that have occurred. Um, but I think you were involved in one of those situations. Can you just walk us through what happened during that event? Yeah. So to give sort of a broader context, you know, my role during that time was twofold. Mm -hmm. One uh, was as a citizen and as a black man. You know, I'm I'm part of this national conversation of protest against police brutality but at the same time I work in city government and if there's a way I can be an intermediary and a liaison between you know how to communicate as you just described that's the role I wanted to play so when it came to protesters who have a constitutional right to do right. so uh, should be allowed to do so uh, in a peaceful way um, the various groups that were protest I would be there each at each protest, whether my services were needed or not. Uh, you know, 
was the case and sometimes wasn't the case. But when I saw that there could be potential tension and it was there at that night at the governor's mansion, you had the Indiana State Police as well as the IMPD. Uh, and they, their goal was to rush the governor's mansion. That's what they wanted to send a message. But the reality is they weren't going to be allowed to do that without a fight. All right. And uh, by the time I was called there to the scene, because I was asked to come to the scene, um, <clears throat> I saw that tension mounting. And uh, for my own safety and everybody else's safety, as you know, police were, were prepared to draw their, their weapons and, and they also had pepper guns, I said, wait a minute, let's, let's try to negotiate because it could be that you may get what you want. But if y'all don't communicate, we won't know what that is. So uh, one thing led to another. Um, one of the organizers there, uh, I led him to uh, IMPD and uh, State Police Command who were there. They talked it through. Um, they were allowed to protest a little longer than the police originally were going to allow them to. Mm -hmm. um, they decided to uh, come to a place of mutual understanding and respect. And one thing led to another, and that's what happened. And uh, I just walked home with one thought in mind, and that was, thank God we didn't have an incident in our city that right. we just didn't need. I mean, I just got a, an alert on my phone just minutes ago that one of the officers who was involved in one of the protests in May was just uh, charged with battery. I, and many of us saw that, uh, I think, the hitting of the young woman uh, with the baton. That went viral. It went national. And for the longest, people were saying, well, something should be done about that. Well, today, something was done about that. And those are the types of incidences, I think, that we see filmed and on camera time and time and time again. I think the general public just wants to see fair and equitable policing that doesn't seem to target black people. And until we make those changes, we're going to have the same tension. Yeah, it, it's amazing because I think... Um as blacks, we're realists in terms of like, just like there, there's bad preachers and good preachers, there's bad politics, there's bad football. I mean, any um, industry there is, there's, there's good and bad, right? right. Um, the challenge that we face is that when it deals with policing, right. and um, especially with African Americans, black folks, yeah, it's bad people, but they're not punished. That's, and, that's what it seems, right? Right, and, and that's the, and that's the, I guess the biggest beef is it's like, all right, this stuff occurs, but then, you know, in Minneapolis, Minneapolis, right, the officers weren't charged um, immediately. And, and and even the first autopsy report right. was that, oh, he was smoking and he was under some other influence that caused the death. Right. Like, we didn't watch someone. So I think it's that what really makes, <laughs> you know, blacks angry. And like you said, it's literally the tipping point that led to some of the, the, the protests. Right. And, and unfortunately, some of the riots that, that yeah. we had. Yeah, just look at some of the statistics. You just mentioned Minneapolis, Minneapolis, right? The argument was, well, you know, it's very hard to prosecute a police officer in Minneapolis. Well, wait a minute, the only one in history that has ever been prosecuted was a black police officer. Right. If you remember that, the, the black, I think he was uh, Ethiopian, mm -hmm. he shot a white woman. He's in prison as we speak. Wow. So it's not that hard. But it seems like there is disproportionality when black is involved, and that's what we're arguing. We've been arguing this for 400 years. It's nothing new. Nah, that's awesome. All right, well, great. Well, we're going to follow up with some questions dealing with the government. I'll also talk about George Floyd. Um, we'll be right back, but definitely stay tuned and catch the second half. All right, so um, let's discuss now a little bit of the actual uh, protests that occurred um, on the monument. Um, I know some of those protests, again, began peaceful. Right. And unfortunately, they led to uh, some riots. Right. Um, from my perspective, outside looking in, and I saw this in a lot of other cities, it looked like there was two sets of people. It looked like there was people there to peacefully protest, right. and then there was people there with the idea to riot. Right. And I think um, just like we can separate there's good cops and bad cops, we should also be able to separate that there's people who want to peacefully protest and those people that want to riot. Right. So as a direct result of that, obviously, you know, the police, and then um, now I feel like downtown Indianapolis um, has really not recovered yet. I mean, there was uh, buildings that were boarded up for a long period of time. Um, what's going on in terms of, like, the government's um, response to some of those riots and protests? Uh, looking back at hindsight, is there anything different that could occur that could have been safer? Or do you think that was just 
we just have to move forward now, come up with a plan to kind of, you know, get downtown back bustling. Yeah, I think you're right. I think uh, we have a lot of things at play. Um, definitely, there were some who came to insight, mm -hmm. uh, either violence and or rioting, and just wanted to destroy property. Um, there's another element of protesters who wanted their message to be heard. They had a list of demands, but they did so in a peaceful manner. And I think they got further eventually than the, some of the rioters did. But, you know, one of the things that is not widely shared is I remember the posting of 12 individuals who were arrested for rioting. They were all black. Mm -hmm. But businesses who sent me and others actual photos of people who were vandalizing their businesses uh, were caught on camera, they were white, but I didn't see very many white people arrested. So again, we have a little bit of uh, inequity going on, a little bit of disproportionality going on. So I know it's hard to find and to differentiate who is legitimate and who's not, but if you have that stuff on camera, we should be pursuing individuals who actually did the damage. Right. Um, and it's unfortunate for many of the businesses because not only did they have to deal with the rioting, but they dealt with COVID. And, you know, we had a shutdown. I think during those couple of weeks, we had curfews that were in force. So all of that affects business. And many businesses have not recovered. Some are back open doing very well. I know the mayor has met with them. Um, of course, there's the PPE loans and, and small business loans, which I encourage everybody to apply for. But uh, it's gonna take some time for us to recover economically, I think, not only from COVID, but from some of the protests. Right. Um, I, I saw like uh, yesterday in the Twitter post, I think there's one of the studio uh, uh, downtown on the square that, that shut the doors and they mentioned COVID, right. the protests, you know. Um, They've been around for a number of years. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, also, there was something else online, someone else, I'll stick on Twitter, talked about like um, the, uh, unfortunately, the homeless population as downtown, and um, I guess the numbers are continuing to rise, right? I mean, it makes sense. People go over losing their jobs. Um, they're congregating at downtown. Like, what, what's being done from a public safety standpoint in regards to, like, some of these issues of homelessness? Is this perceived, or is this a real issue in terms of, like, um, some homelessness or, or people on the street and, and things like that occurring downtown? No, it's definitely real, and uh, we're trying to get... We, this is something that certainly predates COVID and, and all of the protests, but the homeless issue in and of itself is a major issue in downtown Indianapolis. And uh, between the Rubin Engagement Center, which really doesn't provide enough beds, uh, and the need for a facility that actually, that can address the homeless population, just besides will or mission, you know, we really need a mechanism in place that we don't currently have. And so we're doing the best we can to partner with various agencies. We're doing a great job. But again, the, the issue is uh, resources and, and ways to figure out, you know, hotels have opened some of their doors and they've been great partners with the city. But uh, again, we need a facility that can house and address the short-term and long-term issues of our homeless population. Right, now that makes a lot of sense. I think um, uh, our foundation, we're doing it to a little mission and just going and sp speaking to some of those people, man, they just they just need a chance, right? Uh, right. Either employment or a place to stay, somewhere to kind of get back on our feet. Um, but it's unfortunate, again, good and bad, right? Some of those people, unfortunately, uh, maybe about the drugs or other type of stuff. Right. So I think um, I think coming up with solutions are, is better than you know being critical and, and complaining about everything. Absolutely. Um, in terms of like, what can people do? Like downtown Indy is is back open. Obviously, it has restrictions. Right. I, I think a lot of people, for one reason or another, maybe it's the riots, maybe it's COVID but they aren't visiting downtown Indianapolis. <laughs> and and it's struggle, right? It's tough because right. all these other neighborhoods, I, like I live in Carmel, right? So they have their nice the fishers. So everyone's built these other, but if if we fail at the city of Indianapolis in our downtown center, I mean, it, it's gonna be long-term ramifications, right. ramifications for everybody. Right, yeah, we have to patronize our businesses, local businesses. We mm -hmm. talked about supporting black businesses, but you know, we have to, regenerate the economy so it, there's a little bit of give and take right so you know if we talk about our downtown we need to be willing to go down and spend some money mm -hmm. uh, and support some of the businesses that are struggling so you know a lot of times I, my wife and I will go down and, and have a date and eat at a restaurant we haven't eaten at downtown to support downtown business specifically Mass Ave is a great place but you know uh, the mayor 
shut off parts of the street so that we can have more pedestrian traffic in hopes that that will drive interest in walking through downtown. We have a beautiful downtown, mm. but uh, you know we have to be willing to support it as well. All right. Um, lastly, man, this has been great, and it's definitely probably part two, especially as um, the political climate, <laughs> you know, uh, begin to escalate with the uh, presidential election oh, yeah. coming up in November. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that's going to keep us all busy. Um, but in terms of action steps, I think a lot of people feel like um, they're hopeless. There's nothing that they could do. But but there is stuff that they could do, right? right. Um, what are some of the steps that they can take? What are some of the websites they can visit to really just yeah. get more informed about some of the issues that's going on downtown? Yeah, I encourage anybody. And the city's general website is indy.gov, www.indy.gov. Type in whatever you want to know about. If it's, if it's police body cams, if it's use of force, if it's ways to get involved, anything. We have a, a tab specifically dedicated to COVID, all of our relief efforts for the city. There's money available if you're unemployed. Uh, there, there are certain funds. If you're a, a, a nonprofit, you know, there's money for nonprofits, for churches. I mean, everything that we have available is there on the website. So I want to encourage anyone to, to first, you know, inform yourself as to what's available. And then second, um, get involved. Uh, just tonight, we, we are hosting a community conversation around public safety. Now, I know a lot of people in the black community feel like we're tired of talking, we're tired of having conversations. You know what we need, so let's just enact the policies. I get that, but there's there's value in having the conversation. So those with who are highly opinionated, we see those opinions on Facebook. Right. I challenge you to get involved and be a part of the conversation because your voice can and will be heard. Those uh, sessions are recorded. Uh, we'll go back. The mayor will see. Uh, IMPD will listen. Uh, the community will listen. And I say get involved and let your voice be heard. Man, that's awesome. And what, what website can they go to find like some of those information in terms of like some of those town halls that occur? Like, where is that typically posted at in terms of dates? That will also be posted at indy.gov. Indy.gov. Yeah, indy.gov. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So you personally, we talked about Deputy Mayor, like what's next for, for, <laughs> for you? I know we talked about a little bit in terms of, um, I mean, currently you have a three-year contract with the city. Obviously, a lot of well, guys... Well, actually, no. Uh, no, I don't have a contract. Oh, no? No, we, we you know... Uh, God willing, if, if the mayor wants to do another term, okay, he's free to to uh, try to run again for mayor. There's no term limit for okay. mayor. Yeah, but yeah, we do have three three years left in this administration. Oh, on, on this, right, right, okay. So uh, you know, we have to begin to think about what we're going to do right, right. <laughs> after this after this administration. So I'm open. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a free agent. <laughs> I love it. Free agents. That means like bucks. Um, now, but it, it, it's amazing, man. I've just watched your career. Um, I think we participated in a fashion show years ago. Oh, that's right. It was right. Uh, over there and um, <laughs> seeing each other at Black Expo and right. another events, man. And I just always admired you, man, just being a man of God, being a pastor. Yeah, I appreciate you know, it. You know, the, the Likewise. Person, and then Likewise. the deputy mayor, I think um, not a lot of people are willing to serve in that capacity. Uh, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. I'm just, I'm open to whatever God, you know, however God wants to use me. Um, you know, I'm just thankful and humble. Um, to serve, that's my whole life has been in, in service, public service, whether it's through the church or whatever, civic, civil service. I love what I do, so hopefully I can keep doing it. Right. So last question, my um, <clears throat> it's funny. My mom, ordained Reverend, we talked about that. Yeah. made me. And the one time, first time I was captain in college, and I was telling my man, I gotta lead all these people, five star recruits, big high schools. What if they don't listen to me? She mm -hmm. just, baby, just serve. Like, well, what if what if they talk back? Baby, just serve. And it's just, it's amazing, right? Yeah, obviously in the book it says, you know, the greatest among us will serve. Right. Um, so it's just truly a testament. And, and throughout your career, you, you experience success. My name of the podcast is Success Leads Clues. So what clue would you have in order for someone who's looking to be successful, looking to find their identity? What kind of clue would you kind of give them that they can uncover, that you uncover, that can, can help you think your testimony help them with what they're doing? Wow. I say first, you have to be willing to to embrace who you are mm -hmm. and that is the good and the bad just uh, don't try to be something you're not you're gonna make mistakes nobody's perfect but second is make sure you walk in faith and not fear I mm -hmm. think fear holds us all back uh, whether that's fear of success fear of failure fear of being who you are I think the most successful people and people who I admire are people who are brave enough 
to just be themselves and they expose all of who they are, the good, the bad, the ugly. That's it. You know, we, we all just sat as a society. I thought, man, I felt so bad for Will and Jada. Mm. You know, they're human beings. They got a marriage like everybody else has, a pri but but their privacy can't be private. It's public. Right. Right, right. But they're brave enough, and that's yeah. why they're wealthy and successful. Yeah. They're willing to put themselves out there like that. And, uh, and I'm growing in that area, too. But mm. I would say that if you could put yourself out there and let God do the rest, success will find you. Awesome. Well, thanks again, friend, for being Thank on. You. I definitely appreciate it. Uh, where can they find you at Twitter, Instagram? Are you is it, uh, David Hampton or where? where do you yeah, have? Uh, Doctor Dot David nineteen eleven on my Instagram and uh, Doctor David Hampton on Facebook. Awesome, man. So definitely uh, reach out to him if you have any questions or anything that you feel like um, you want to have uh, uh, one of your questions answered. Uh, but th thank you for tuning in again for another episode of Success in These Fools. I mean, I think having on um, government officials, leaders, things that are current right now, it's just important as we all have this journey of success, all have this journey of becoming a champion. It's about learning more, doing more, overcoming that, feel, that fear, and um, going out there living um, in your true identity. Hope you guys tune in next week.